Good morning. We have general questions. Question number one, Clay Baker. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met NHS Fife and what issues were discussed. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson. Ministers and government officials regularly meet with representatives of NHS Fife to discuss matters of importance to local people. Clear Baker. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary is well aware of the pressures that are facing NHS Fife, including bed blocking and breaches of waiting time guarantees. In 2013, the then Cabinet Secretary for Health said he wanted to accelerate the pace of change towards seven-day services. Labour have this week called for £100 million from budget consequentials to create a frontline fund to take forward this ambition by easing the pressure on frontline staff and providing better patient care. Uh, will she support it? Cabinet Secretary. Well, can I, can I say to Claire Baker that, of course, we are already taking significant action. The £100 million for tackling delayed discharge, which I think is a, a better uh, phrase than bed blocking, to tackle delayed discharge over three years will make a huge difference to the partnerships going forward from the 1st of April. And, of course, it, it, Fife will get uh, its share of that resource. That's in addition, of course, to NHS Fife's uplift through the NRAC allocation, which I'm sure the member would want to welcome, which means that Fife's uh, total budget uplift next year will be £19.5 million. In terms of seven-day services, uh, I'm not sure if the member is aware, but a task force that we established is looking at seven-day services and has been over the last year. I would suggest that it's better to um, wait for the recommendations and the information coming out of that expert group. These are people who know what they're talking about and will inform us in terms of how we develop seven-day services. I would suggest that we should wait and see what they have to say. Roger Campbell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary, you may be aware that in the year to uh, December, um, NHS Fife has made use of the Integrated Community Assessment Support Service to extend to more than 2,000 people. Can you confirm whether you will encourage further use of that scheme, both in Fife and elsewhere? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I, I would. I, I think it's a, a good model. I think it provides an opportunity for the integrated partnerships going forward to look at some of the things that have already been successful, whether that's in Fife or elsewhere. Uh, and I think we should recognise that integration from the 1st of April provides the, the biggest reform we have seen really in our, our public services for, for a generation. Uh, but it's only going to be as good as the plans that those partnerships bring forward. And I would hope that the type of service that uh, Roger Campbell has described would feature not just in Fife's uh, uh, integrated partnership <coughs> plan, but elsewhere in Scotland as well. Question two, Graham Pearson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it has made in setting up the Energy Jobs Task Force. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding Officer, the First Minister announced the establishment of the Energy Jobs Task Force on Wednesday, the 14th of January, in Aberdeen, where she was meeting key stakeholders in the oil and gas industry. The task force will be chaired by Lena Wilson, the Chief Executive of Scottish Enterprise, and the first meeting will take place later this month. Graham Pearson. Uh, I am grateful for that reply. In the third quarter of 2014, refined petroleum chemicals and pharmaceuticals fell by 2 per cent. Since then, the price of oil has fallen significantly. Whilst I appreciate the efforts that have been described this morning, is the Government considering any other actions uh, to help the people in this vital uh, industry? Cabinet Secretary. The Government is taking a number of steps, as have been shared with Parliament on a number of occasions, to support the developments in the oil and gas sector. Um, Mr Ewing is in fact in Aberdeen today meeting companies uh, as he has done persistently during his term in office as the Energy Minister and he will continue that direct dialogue with individual companies. Um, the Government has set out a range of interventions that were taken to support innovation. Indeed, I was discussing the the Oil and Gas Innovation Centre, which has been funded by the Scottish Funding Council at the Government's request um, just the other evening uh, at an event in Parliament, and we are supporting the internationalisation of business activities into the bargain. Crucially, of course, the issue which the industry requires to see addressed is the fiscal regime in the North Sea sector, and that is an issue upon which the Government has made representations to the UK Government. Mark MacDonald. Presiding officer, as the Cabinet Secretary rightly outlines, the fiscal regime is critical uh, in supporting the industry and ensuring that jobs can be protected, particularly through, for example, 
exploration activity being augmented by tax credits, which the Government, I know, has made a strong submission on. And there was uh, backing today from the Institute of Directors at the, the Devolution Further Powers Committee that action should be taken here and now and not wait until the Budget. Can I ask if the Cabinet Secretary has received any communication from the Treasury since the Scottish Government made its submission uh, in relation to uh, support for the oil and gas sector? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, first of all, President Officer, can I say that uh, I very much welcome the contribution that has been made to the debate by the Institute of Directors. I thought it was a, uh, a, a particularly thoughtful and, um, and focused intervention in the debate to address the issue about which the oil and gas sector is most concerned, and that is to secure an improvement in the fiscal regime. Um, the Scottish Government will continue to raise the issues uh, particularly about exploration tax credits, uh, but also about the level of the supplementary charge, which we believe is too high, and also about the encouragement of an investment allowance uh, with the United Kingdom Government. And we will, of course, advise Parliament of any response we hear from the UK Government. But I stress the point that the First Minister made um, in her previous uh, comments, that we need to see action on this question before the Budget in March. Question three, Jim Eady. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to promote training and skills development in the road haulage industry. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. Uh, skills Development Scotland offer a range of services for both individuals and employers. SDS can offer employers a contribution to the cost of training through the Freight Logistics Modern Apprenticeship Framework. Additionally, Transport Scotland does work in partnership with freight industry stakeholders on how best to meet the industry's needs over a whole range of issues. It has facilitated discussion between the freight trade associations and Skills Development Scotland on training and skills development. Jamiri. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, but is she aware that there is currently a shortage of drivers for heavy goods vehicles? There are companies who want to recruit young people but do not have the funds and support to train them, and there are young people who would relish the opportunity to work in this sector. Therefore, what more can the Scottish Government do to ensure that its modern apprenticeship scheme is properly aligned with the needs of the logistics sector, that schools and careers guidance are fully engaged in making young people aware of the opportunities which exist? And will she meet with me and other interested MSPs to discuss a skills academy to bring together education and training providers and the industry to address the needs of the sector? Cabinet Secretary. I, I am aware that uh, uh, the industry is currently reporting a shortage of HG, HGV drivers. Um, it may be compounded by an ageing workforce. Uh, however, I am pleased to hear that there are companies in Scotland who do want to re uh, recruit and train uh, young people. Uh, there is, of course, a minimum age for HGV drivers. Uh, um, however, we are keen to do what we can to increase the modern apprenticeship opportunities for young people in this important sector. Uh, it is worth remembering that SDS can make contributions to the cost of training. I know that Transport Scotland officials have already met with the Road Haulage Association to discuss uh, the issue. Uh, and of course I would be happy to meet with the member and indeed any others uh, interested in this to discuss how we can ensure that young people are aware of and can access the opportunities that the industry presents. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. But, uh, it appeared from a meeting that we had just the other evening in this building that the heavy goods transport industry uh, is in a critical situation regarding recruitment. So I would ask the Scottish Government how it will ensure, will ensure that in SDS engages with the road haulage industry as a matter of urgency in order to encourage easy entry of new skilled drivers into the industry. Well, I did indicate in my earlier answer that Transport Scotland officials are already engaged in this conversation uh, and they will continue to discuss any issues of concern with the freight trade associations uh, working in partnership uh, with officials from inside my own portfolio and from Skills Development Scotland to help meet their current and future skills needs. And I know that a meeting is taking place between the RHA and SDS in February to explore the issue further. Question four, Stuart Stevenson. To ask the Scottish Government how the 15.2 million allocated to NHS Grampian for 2015-16 will benefit patient care. Cabinet Secretary Sean Robinson. NHS Grampian have welcomed the additional £15.2 million from the Scottish Government. It is currently working up plans on how best to use this extra funding for the benefit of its patients. Stuart Stevenson. Uh, following 
Following the news this week of a highly successful uh, scheme pioneered by the Henry Ford Medical Group in Detroit, uh, where the suicide rate among patients has fallen by 75% within four years, are there any plans to implement any strategies that would specifically target suicide rates in Grampian? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, can I say to the member, I'm certainly more than happy to, to look into that uh, research in more detail. I think we should always look at emerging findings from, from elsewhere. However, um, meantime, NHS Grampian uh, works in partnership with uh, Murray, Aberdeen and Aberdeenshire Councils, Police Scotland and third sector partners on suicide prevention strategies and plans. There are well-established uh, initiatives in place across Grampian in a range of community settings following the strategy used in Choose Life, which has been uh, very successful. And indeed, uh, other countries have looked at uh, adopting the, the Choose Life strategy. The essence of it being that they, they work collaboratively collaboratively with partners to reduce suicidal behaviour by reviewing data and understanding trends, providing support to those affected and working with local community planning partnerships to raise awareness of suicide behaviour awareness training. Lewis MacDonald. Thank you very much. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary, I uh, agree indeed that in relation to both the wider question and Stuart Stevenson's supplementary the importance of mental health services delivered uh, at Cornhill Hospital in Aberdeen and will she agree that as part of her conversations with NHS Grampian on the use of these additional funds uh, to address the, the very clear uh, pressures that they face uh, in delivering services at Cornhill? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, at the annual review, uh, the, the issue of mental health services uh, came up um, and uh, was well um, discussed. I would expect NHS Grampian to look across all of their services, how they make the improvements that they need to, to make, how they meet the targets and the standards that we would expect them to meet. I have to say, though, that that job has been made a lot easier by the acceleration of the NRAC funding, uh, which is resulting in over £49 million of an uplift to NHS Grampian next year. I would hope that's something that the member would welcome. Question five, Jenny Mara. To ask the Scottish Government when a community justice centre, as recommended by the Commission on Women Offenders, will open in Dundee, given that Dundee has the highest percentage of female problem drug use in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Following the publication of the Commission on Women Offenders report in 2012, the Scottish Government officials worked with community justice leaders in Dundee to help them develop a local service for women who offend, as we have done right across the country. The team in Dundee decided not to establish a justice centre for women. They decided instead that developing their dedicated women offenders team, which had already been praised by the Commission as an example of good practice, was the right thing to do to deliver the best services for women in Dundee. We supported this decision and we provided more than £237,000 in grant funding since 2013 to expand the women offenders team in the city. The team provides a broad range of services for women involved in the criminal justice system in line with the Commission's recommendations. Jenny Marner. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for his answer. Can I ask him if he's going to consider Labour's call to reconsider the super prison in Inverclyde, given that the Angelini Commission did recommend services and rehabilitation much closer to the communities? Cabinet Secretary. Um, as I uh, outlined to the Justice Committee on the 16th of December, there's a proposal being put to me by the at Scottish Prison Service, and I am considering that matter at the present time, and I will make an announcement in due course. Question number six, Richard Baker. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making on the introduction of its revised business rates incentivisation scheme. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Presiding officer, I announced the introduction of the revised agreed business rates incentivisation scheme as part of my parliamentary statement on the 2015-16 local government finance settlement on the 11th of December. Richard Baker. Thank you. Under the new BRIS scheme, Aberdeen has been set a far higher target rate for business rate collection, some £50 million higher, even though with the fall of oil prices, income from rates must be expected to decrease locally. How can this scheme be judged to have worked in any way for Aberdeen if it fails to allow more funds raised in the city to be invested in the local economy at the very time it's needed most? Given events in the energy industry, will he consider revising the target? Cabinet Secretary. 
President Officer, the process of arriving at the business rates incentivisation scheme was a joint piece of work between the Scottish Government and local authorities in Scotland. Uh, there was a joint group between uh, the Government and uh, the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities that formulated recommendations which were accepted by both ministers and leaders of local government within Scotland. Um, we will continue to uh, revise the, uh, review the scheme as it takes its course. We have set targets for 2014-15 and 2015-16, and of course the government will continue to review uh, all of these matters as we proceed in the period going forward. Gavin Brown. You were about to enter financial year 2015-16. Uh, has the business rates incentivisation scheme for 2013-14 been sorted out yet? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, what I said to Parliament was that uh, the, we were unable to reach agreement about the application of the business rates incentivisation scheme in 2013-14. So the scheme would not apply in that year. But it has, we have secured agreement for 2014-15 and 2015-16. And I would have thought that would have been a welcome to Mr Brown. Question number seven, Michael McMahon. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the most recent homelessness statistics. Minister, Margaret Burgess. The Scottish Government welcomes the reduction in homelessness shown in the most recent statistics for the second quarter of 2014-15. The 3% reduction in applications follows a trend of falling numbers seen in recent years and we have seen a fall of 36% since 2008-2009. This is mainly due to the ongoing focus on prevention by local authorities and their partners. The Scottish Government is continuing to support this alongside taping, taking steps to increase housing supply. Michael McMahon. I thank the Minister for her response. And while the reported fall in the number of homelessness applications is to be very much welcome, does the Minister recognise that within the overall homelessness statistics are worrying tre uh, trends which require to be addressed? For instance, given that it is the case that the longer families have lived in temporary accommodation, the more likely they were to attribute their worsening health to their accommodation. Can she tell the Chamber what this is specifically she is doing to address this issue? And also, given that homeless children are two to three times more likely to be absent from school and are three to four times more likely to have mental health problems, does she share my concern for the impact that the picture of lengthening stays will have on the almost 5,000 children now living longer in temporary accommodation? Minister. I think uh, what, what I would say to the member is that uh, I'm concerned about any homeless uh, family in Scotland and that's why we're working hard uh, with our partners to increase the supply of housing in Scotland and also reduce the, the length of time uh, households are in temporary accommodation. But most households in temporary accommodation are waiting for settled accommodation and I think the shelter re report showed the average is around 18 weeks. And we are taking steps to improve the quality of information we hold in the length of time people spend in temporary accommodation to better inform our approach in the future. And we've started a consultation with the chief uh, housing officers in this regard, and we're expecting a response by the end of January. But I do think it is worth noting that the vast majority of temporary accommodation for homeless households will be of a good quality, well-managed social housing, and, and, and it's not always the picture that we are hearing. Households are rarely placed in poor quality temporary accommodation and the unsuitable accommodation of, of order covers accommodation for children, pregnant women and we have just strengthened that, this to ensure the wind and water type. Yeah. Question eight, Annabel Goldie. To um, ask the Scottish Government how it is planning to meet any increase in demand for NHS services over the next five years. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robson. NHS boards are responsible for planning and delivering services to meet the needs of their local population now and in the future. Our 2020 vision sets out a clear strategic direction on how we expect health and social care services to be delivered in the years ahead, and the Scottish Government is working closely with the NHS to make this happen. Signing officer, one area where the demand for NHS services is expanding dramatically is my home village of Bishopton, an area of urban expansion with 2,500 new houses to be built, of which approximately 300 are now up and occupied while the building work continues. Now, Bishopton has one small health centre creaking at the seams. There is anecdotal evidence that people are going direct to A&E, the very thing we all want to avoid. And to date, not one sod has been cut to create a new health centre. There seems no health board plan for a new health centre. 
Centre, will the Cabinet Secretary is investigate, intervene and revert to me with proposals for re resolving this intolerable situation? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I'm more than happy to write to Annabel Goldie about the specifics and some of the, the, the plans for, for Bishopton. But on a general note, it's very important that the shifting the balance of care from the acute to the primary care sector happens. It needs to happen more quickly, and that does require the investment in local services. And that's a, an issue we'll be discussing later this afternoon in the 2020 vision and as we take forward the plans over the next few months. Thank you. That ends topical questions. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question one, Keza Dugdale. Do you ask the First Minister?